Okay, I think we may have gotten cut off in the previous video somewhere around here where I was talking about these single nucleotide polymorphisms. <coughs> and what uh, the point I was trying to make is that these are particular spots in the human genome or any genome for that matter where there's a lot of variation in that single base, that single nucleotide that's there. And these can be associated with either normal or, for, or disease causing forms of genes and so it can be a simple way to sample the DNA and see if you have this particular form of the SNP there then it can mean, not absolutely, but it can increase the chance that it has basically a disease causing allele and um, perhaps be a clue that you need to do further investigation on that allele SNPs. All right. Cloning, um, we talked about gene cloning earlier and creating these, um, these genomic libraries. Here we're going to talk about cloning whole organisms. And of course asexual reproduction is a way that happens uh, naturally, but uh, we have figured out how to do this um, um, through sort of forcing the matter, if you will. In plants, this has been done quite some time and it's relatively easy to do in plants. You can take, for example, cells from a carrot and under the right conditions it will begin to form a new carrot plant. Um, plants, their cells tend to remain what you would say is totipotent that is, they have the total potency. That is, they can become any other type of cell for the most part. Um, again, under the right conditions, this can be done. Now, animals, it's a little trickier because um, if you take a um, cell from a differentiated, a differentiated cell from an animal, it tends not to be totipotent. Um, and you can see in this experiment what they do is you've got a um, egg here and if you remove the or it remove essentially the nucleus from that egg cell and you take the nucleus from a different cell and transplant it in it will begin to develop but when that transplanted nucleus comes from one of these fully differentiated cells development just sort of proceeds and then stops. Whereas if that nucleus came from a relatively undifferentiated early embryonic cell, it has a much greater chance of then developing into a, um, into a fully developed organism. So essentially, you have created a clone of this embryo using an enucleated egg, an egg in which the nucleus has been removed. So this is the common, using nuclear transplantation is the way that it's done in animals. And so this is how they've created some cloned mammals. Dolly the sheep you've probably heard of. And here's CC here, cloned cat, which is a clone here of rainbow. Now, as is pointed out in the book, you'll notice that CC and rainbow don't really look exactly alike. They are both females. and Rainbow is a, a calico, but um, CC is not so much. And this goes to show that while they are genetically identical, through development and through time, essentially those genes can be expressed in different ways. So even if you create a clone, that clone, will, those genes will not always be expressed in the same way. And we, there's no reason we wouldn't expect a similar outcome if we were to ever clone a person. Now, stem cells, I'm sure you've heard a lot about stem cells. Um, these are relatively undifferentiated cells and can be of great value medically for, um, they could be used to do cloning if you wanted to, but they're also used just to do, to try to tr treat and do research on different conditions. If you take embryonic stem cells, they are again relatively undifferentiated and so they can be um, coerced into becoming different types of cells and then those cells can be used uh, in a person to treat some kind of damaged cells that they have. 
Um, but then in developed in adult individuals, you have particular kinds of stem cells in your bone marrow. You have these relatively undifferentiated cells that become different types of blood cells. Now, coercing them into come, becoming something like a liver or nerve cell would be a much more difficult proposition. But as you probably know, there's been a lot of controversy about using embryonic stem cells because as part of the process of using them, you have to basically dismantle or destroy the embryo, and um, there is some opposition to that. Now, in other countries, there's no opposition to this, and this, this kind of research is going on, but here in the United States, it's not so much. Um, at least not with federal money. You can use private money to do it, but not federal money. Okay. Last thing here, section four. So now some applications of DNA technology and specifically treating some diseases here with gene therapy. So in gene therapy, what you're attempting to do is this individual has some defective gene. Um, they may have cystic fibrosis, for example. And so they have a mutant form of a gene that creates a protein that's problematic and they produce too much mucus in their lungs, for example. So what you're attempting to do is get a good version of that gene into the appropriate cells. You don't need to get it all over their body because not all of their cells express the gene. You only need to get into those that express the gene. And you'll use some kind of vector to do this. And in this case, we're using a virus, one of these retroviruses. And now it's a virus that you would have engineered to not cause disease, but just simply to transport this good copy of the gene in. And again, you can target that virus for the cells that need to be um, uh, changed, if you will, or engineered, whether it's bone marrow cells or your lung cells, and you're trying to get that virus in there so that it'll insert that genomic material, that nucleic acid, into those cells, and you hope that those cells will take up that good form of the gene and start making use of it. This is um, still very much an experimental procedure. It's not being done widely just yet. Another thing, what you call farm animals or pharmacy animals, and these are animals that have been engineered to contain genes such that they will produce particular compounds, say, in their milk, in the case of this goat. And the goal here is to create an animal that then can be used to supply this, this um, particular material, this particular compound in its, in its milk. And it could be something like um, a pharmaceutical product of some sort that maybe needs to be stored under refrigerated conditions, but you have areas of the globe where refrigeration is of limited um, supply. And so you can have the animal there which can supply this needed compound to these, these people <coughs> instead of having it to be having need to refrigerate. This is also a very much an experimental procedure as well. Forensic analysis. Now, this is done widely, as you know, if you've ever watched any of these crime shows, um, specifically DNA fingerprinting. And so here, you're using the variation that exists between individuals to create what we call a, quote, a DNA fingerprint. Not a literal fingerprint, but a DNA fingerprint. And so here, as is mentioned in the book, there are these what are called these short tandem repeats. So in some of the non-coding regions of the genome, you have these short sections of nucleotides that are re repeated again and again and again. And the number of those repeats um, in certain sections of the genome will vary between individuals. And so if you can splice out and copy these sections of DNA using PCR, you can then do electrophoresis, and that is the fingerprint you're creating. So we can see in this example here, we've got evidence from a crime scene. We've got some blood that isn't from the victim, but it's a messy crime scene, and presumably it came from one of the suspects. 
And here's our two suspects. And so you can see the DNA, of course, again, we're diploid organisms. We have two copies of each chromosome. In one copy, there was 12 repeats, and in one, there was 16. So there was a larger piece, the 16, and the smaller piece, the 12. So this person was essentially heterozygous, you might say. Now, suspect A, you can see he has the 12 repeat, but he's homozygous for that. So he only has one band that shows up. There's two pieces, but they essentially overlap, so they appear as one band. Suspect B, on the other hand, you can see his DNA matches with that from the crime scene. He has the 12 and the 16. Now, as, as is stressed in the book, this is only one particular part of the genome that you're looking at. But if you're going to do this um, in reality, you will look at several parts of the genome, tens of parts, if you will, because any one match, matching any one location, you know, there could be any number of people who have that match. But if you do this for 10 or 20 or more parts of the genome, if that individual matches in all those sections the DNA from the crime scene, that increases your certainty that it came from that individual a great deal. And so that is essentially DNA fingerprinting. And you're looking at several regions, non-coding regions of the DNA um, to match an individual with some sample. All right. And as I talked about a little earlier with using these techniques, using plasmids and such, we can create what we call genetically modified organisms or transgenic organisms. These are organisms that contain DNA from another organism, from another species. And these techniques here, splicing a particular gene into the plasmid of this bacterium, agrobacterium, tumefaciens, it's one that normally causes a disease in plants, but you're going to use it to transfer a particular gene of interest into this plant. And this gene might come from another type of plant, from another bacterium, from an animal, whatever. And we can get this plant to express this gene after we have essentially moved it into them using this plasmid. And we've created that transgenic or genetically modified organism. This has been done quite a bit in plants. Um, if you've ever heard of Roundup, Roundup is a herbicide, and there are now Roundup ready soybeans. There's Roundup ready cotton. There might even be Roundup ready um, uh, corn, I'm not sure. But essentially, these plants have been engineered to resist this herbicide so that you can then spray the field with the herbicide and it'll kill the weeds but not kill the crop plant. Now, perhaps you're aware that there's been also controversy about GMOs and whether or not we should be doing this. Um, but it is do being widely done with, um, with many crop plants. Now, there's, of course, questions about the safety of the plants, um, which there's a lot of debate about that. Something that's becoming more apparent and not any question about this is that, well, what happens when you spray fields with Roundup year after year, what happens to the weeds? Well, you get the development of Roundup resistant weeds. And how does this happen? Well, I'll let you think about that for a little while, and we can talk about it in class. But that's what they're finding through much of the agricultural regions of the country where Roundup is used. You can see in particular, um, Missouri is heavily hit, and then Iowa and Indiana, Ohio, Arkansas, they're more and more of these weeds are starting to show up that are resistant to Roundup. And so in your soybean field, these are a bunch of ragweed plants here, and they're now starting to sprout up, and they're sort of in the way and annoying and taking nutrients from your soybean plants because the Roundup no longer kills them. Um, so this is sometimes what's described as the sort of the pesticide treadmill in which you start using a pesticide, but then your pest becomes resistant to it. Um, Okay, that's it for chapter 20, a long chapter.